Thank you. Um, I want to first say thank you to Mike for uh, allowing me to come here today and to do this. And to thank you to all of you for coming uh, in what's for everyone is a very, very, very busy time of the semester. Um, so before I begin, I just want to kind of uh, go over a few disclaimers. The first of which is that I am not a technology person per se. <laughs> Okay, I am not someone who, uh, I, I can't do whatever it is he's doing right there. Uh, I have, uh, I just got my first smartphone about four months ago and I am still unlocking its mysteries. Um, and this MacBook is also uh, not, not that old as well. Um, in addition, what, I'm not a, a language pedagogy expert either. Um, my field is actually 20th century of peninsular Spanish literature and visual culture. Um, I do have a background in film and design, and that's part of the reason that I am so interested in effective presentation development. Um, I come here to you today as um, a little bit of a frustrated teacher, and not with my students, but with the models that I've always been given and the models that I've been using that every semester produce the same grammatical errors, the same battles, the same challenges. And somehow I, I said to myself that I had to be able to kind of overcome them. Um, they can't keep messing up, you know, this particular verb for the rest of their lives. Um, they can actually, as it turns out, but we can help them get through that. Uh, and that, that's sort of what I'm doing today. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to talk about this. Um, it's not just about visual media in the beginning language classroom or the intermediate lang language classroom or in the advanced language classroom, but actually all three, that visual media can be used effectively at all three levels. Um, and, and, and across the levels as well, and, and in very, and, but yet roughly in sort of the same way. The first one is in language instruction. Um, you would be hard pressed to find a language textbook these days that doesn't have a technological component. Most of our workbooks are online now. Most of them have a video component and a, a, a companion website that usually the publishing companies are willing to design to our specifications and needs. It's pretty great, actually. Uh, in addition, uh, programs like Keynote and PowerPoint you know, classroom students have been using them in the classroom and teachers have been using the classroom for a while now. They're not new to us. Um, but I'm also going to talk about this in culture and literature instruction as well and how um, visual media can help the intermediate student or the intermediate high, advanced, low student to sort of work through the language issues without, you know, stumbling across big ideas that they just cannot express. Um, this is a painting by Francisco de Goya that we will come back to later on, by the way. Um, finally, um, I'm going to talk about the, oh, sorry about that. No, go back. In student output um, via the digital media project. Um, and this is actually students using visual media in their own classroom work, okay? Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about PowerPoint fatigue um, and exactly what it is. And we, we kind of know what it is if you've seen your students come in with just pages and pages of PowerPoint slides, and I've seen mine do it and highlighting PowerPoint slides. Um, it's an effective tool, but it's a tool that can be used in many different ways. And primarily it's one that's been used by our colleagues in the business and business and sciences. Okay? It's not something that literature and language teachers have used completely to their advantage, right? But it turns out that, um, that we are precisely, those of us in literature and language and the humanities are precisely the people that should be wielding this technique. And the reason is, is that we're the ones that are constructing narratives for our students every single day. Um, a lady named Nancy Duarte for CNN wrote an article about PowerPoint fatigue and, oop, I'm sorry, I keep going, my, my, my little clicker is a little bit ahead of time. Uh, Nancy Duarte for CNN um, basically wrote about the military's recent crackdown on bad PowerPoints. And she said that her research into PowerPoint led her in directions that she didn't realize. And that great, presenter empl great presenters employ the basic narrative techniques used throughout history to connect with audiences and move them to action and new understanding. And that this technology, actually the source of how to use it well, Wherein those of us who were, were you know, work in screenwriting, Greek and Shakespearean drama, mythology, literature, those of us who are, you know, doing that kind of thing. And you know, who knew? We knew how to use PowerPoint so well. Well, we do. We just, you know, didn't realize it yet. So what is exactly PowerPoint fatigue and PowerPoint fatigue triggers? Well, they're exactly what this slide is doing right now. Um, using bullets as if they were connections. These ideas are not connected to one another in any way, shape, or form. Okay? But yet, this construction makes it seem like they are. Um, 
Crazy colors that distract visuals, um, particularly Microsoft PowerPoint. I'm not using Microsoft PowerPoint in full disclosure. I use Keynote, which is the Apple program. Microsoft PowerPoint, the themes and backgrounds usually use very, very bright colors, which can be engaging, um, but it also is very tough on the eye. Uh, the reason newspapers are usually in black and white is because it's easier on the eye. Um, bright white can also be very challenging to, the to somebody who's watching you. Um, centered titles of one to two words. Studies show that people want to see full sentence and fully developed ideas up top. Um, and this is people who have done a lot of research on, on Microsoft. Uh, and the big one, and this is particularly true for language people, is that too many words on one slide. And this is particularly true for the novice level student. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with um, the American Council for Language Teacher um, proficiency guidelines, to give you a brief idea, uh, novice level speakers basically can do nothing but imitate speech, right? They are mimicking you. It is memorized speech. They actually can't process grammatical structures in a way of understanding them, okay? The intermediate speaker can begin to, um, to process that information, can hold, um, the, uh, intermediate high speakers can actually hold a conversation more or less with a, native, uh, with a sympathetic native speaker. They can um, talk about themselves, they can, they can describe things, right? They can sort of start telling stories, but not completely. Versus the advanced level speaker, which you don't really see um, until much, much later on, who can actually narrate details in multiple time frames, okay, with varying degrees of success depending upon how advanced they are, okay. Um, you, with the, 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 the general rule of thumb that I've discovered is that the lower the level, the less words you want in a slide. For the simple reason that they, uh, they can't process, they can't read and listen at the same time. They cannot do it in terms of processing the information. Um, and we'll talk about why in terms of the cognitive load in just a second. But um, just to talk about things that do make a good PowerPoint slide or things that I've discovered that make a good power, PowerPoint slide. The first is a sentence headline, right? And, and thinking about alternative design for a slide, right? Um, you want to sentence headline and you want it to be left justified. People show that we don't read center. We read from left to right. We go from top to bottom. Okay, um, a generous use of white space. You don't want to crowd your material on the screen. It overwhelms the audience, right? And a strong use of visual elements, again, particularly for the novice level language student. And also, if you're working in a communicative classroom, a classroom where it's being taught completely in the target language, students are expected to use the target language at all times, how you introduce new concepts is building on already gained knowledge. And so, for example, if you want to talk about art, right, you're going to take something that they already know, they've already seen, you know, a realist and or a romantic nude. We'll come back to this type of discussion later on. And you give them the foundations of this so that when you show them this, they don't go, huh? And this being a modernist nude, which is called Marcel Duchamp's Nude Descending a Staircase, right? They can understand how this is modernist by understanding how it's not romantic and realist, basically what you just said. So working on found knowledge to move forward, right? And this is where my experience as a modernist comes in and getting tired of having, showing my students something that's modern or postmodern and having go, es extraño, it's weird, right? You're getting tired of them saying that. So working on their already found knowledge. So um, now, my research into all of this has to do with some work that Mike has done and things that I've read in terms of student and, and cognitive load. And what we know about cognitive load theory or how people process information is that there are three types of cognitive load. Right? The first one is intrinsic load. And this is the load that we can't do anything about. This is how hard something is. If you're teaching language, particularly, you're dealing with the fact that it is hard for a student to naturally, they are going to translate the speech in their minds. If I put Spanish up there, they're going to translate it in their mind to English. So actually the intrinsic load should probably be even a little bit more there. It is just naturally challenging for anybody to do that, okay? The next is extraneous load, okay? And this is the presentational mode that we use, the manner in which we present information, okay? Uh, in second language acquisition terms, we call this input, okay? And that being how, they, how we present information. And this is something that we can manipulate, okay? 
For the last part is germane load, okay? And this is the how the, the processing construction of the schema, how the student processes it. In second language acquisition language, it's known as the developing system, the process that's going on in their mind and how they process it. And this is where I go into a relatively new field for me, and, and like I said, I'm not a pedagogy expert, which that is input processing, okay? And this is a concept developed by a gentleman named Bill, uh, I think I, why are you doing that? Oh, sorry. This is a process developed by a man named Bill Van Patten and a book uh, called Input Processing and Grammar Instruction. Um, if you know anything about second language acquisition and the community of classroom, you know that teaching grammar in the language classroom is kind of a controversial thought, um, particularly in the novice level range. The idea being that if they can't process the grammar, if they're just mimicking memorized speech, then how do you teach them grammar? Okay? And Bill Van Patten tries to address this. And he, he begins with one of the founding principles of second language acquisition. And that is all cases of successful first and second language acquisition are characterized by the avail availability of comprehensible input. That is, if I start speaking Spanish right now, none of you are going to know what I am saying. You need comprehensible input in order to process any of my information. He goes on, though, and he creates a model in which comprehensible input is used to help students under, understand underlying grammatical structures. That is, in traditional grammatical instruction, I would teach you a concept, I would give you a drill, and your output is how you would understand the underlying system. Okay, you would process that information and you would start using the present tense. And it's your use of the present tense that helps you understand the grammar construction. It's not a bad thing. The problem is your output doesn't mean anything to you. You're not actually saying anything. You're just drilling a grammar concept into your head. You're not producing meaning. You're not communicating anything. Bill Van Patten argues that this is sort of like examining how a car works by looking at its fumes. Right? You're not going to understand how a car works completely by looking at its fumes. You're, or, or you're not going to help a car run better by using its fumes to understand its fumes. You're going to understand it by understanding its input, by giving it good input, that is good gasoline. Okay? So in the language classroom, the idea is you give them strong, comprehensible input that then they can process and then not simply reproduce or replicate, but actually use to construct their own meaning. And I'll give you an example of how this works with my slides in just a second. But first I wanna talk about an issue that Bill Van Patten does not bring up and what I'm sort of here talking about today is that input does not have to include words. And in fact, it often shouldn't include words, particularly for the novice level student, okay? So let's talk about a, are you gonna do it? There we go. A slide. This is a slide that actually I made. Okay. Um, this is a, a, an adjective clause. If anybody knows what an adjective clause is, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, the idea being, I want to talk about how adjective clauses, which is a clause in a sentence that describes a noun in the main clause or describes the main clause, right? And well, there are many things that I've done wrong here, and I would like to point out that I actually did this. I actually used this in class once. This was a slide that I, I, I this is not something that I just, you know, this is something that took a long, a long time, right? And I've given them the concepts, and then I've given them the examples. This is sort of how the book, you, your textbook, would usually describe something. There are a lot of things I've done wrong here. One, I've put the word adjective clause in Spanish at the top of it, and my students are not, first of all, they don't know what an adjective clause is in English, by the way, usually, 90% of the time. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's just a reality of the situation. The second part is I have given them too much information at once, and it's all just words to them. And second of all, it's so many words that they're not listening to me. And all of a sudden, I've lost control of my grammar instruction of my class, right? So how did I redo this? Well, I took all of this and I broke it down into chunks of visual information, okay? First of all, I did go back to the sentence headline, all right? And, and this is important in the sense, especially in second language acquisition, is students can understand sentences. They may not understand what an adjective clause is or what the main clause is, but they understand in just basic cognates that description is going on. Okay, they can get that. Oh, we're describing. Okay, it's an adjective. We're describing probably nouns. They, they're probably going to get about, about that much of it. And at this point, this is for an intermediate low classroom, so they should be able to know what the word sustantivo means, which is noun. Okay, and the concept I'm trying to explain 
is that this is the main clause, clausula principal, right? And there I am. How are you doing? Right? And I have a professor that, no, I'm pointing this way, I should be pointing this way, likes London. Okay, there I am, right? And there's the construction. This is describing this. I know those of you who don't even speak Spanish, actually, probably, who, does anybody ever speak Spanish? A little bit, yeah, okay. So, you're, the rest of you may not, but you, you know, even if you don't, you can get, I can still point out this is describing this. And in this case, I'm the antecedent. How you doing? The concept, the grammatical concept that I want to communicate is that when this isn't clear, if it says it doesn't exist, right? No existe, by the way, we have to use the subjunctive mood. That being that there's not a single professor. Where is she? I'm not here, obviously. And this, again, I would be doing this all in Spanish. That has a tandem bicycle. And I'm pointing out here that this verb actually is in the subjunctive. And the tandem bicycle joke is a personal inside joke. Uh, I have a tandem bicycle and my students mock me for it. So, and this brings in the issue of context. You should be able to produce meaning with these as well. Now, how are you going, well, what's the difference between you know, having your students replicate this and what you're doing? I've given my students chunks of information that they now can produce meaning with. And I go, there's not a single professor that has a tandem bicycle. And then I go, well, guys, there isn't any professor that finished the sentence. And suddenly, they all can say, there's not a single professor that gives good grades. There's not a single professor that knows what they're doing. La, 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 right? They can make their own little jokes, and they're producing meaning. Okay? They're producing their own meaning, and they're getting the grammar concept. Okay? And the result of this, in the end, is that this is, a very, this is one of the most difficult grammar concepts you can teach to intermediate level students. And the goal for all of us is to be using the target language 90% of the time. More than that, really. And this was the first time I was ever to teach, able to teach this grammar concept in the, completely in the target language from beginning to end. And it was sort of a revelation. I was shocked that they were able to do it. This is third semester Spanish that I did this in, 203, or 2030 now. Okay? And it was, it was, it was quite, it was, it was kind of like, I, I was, you know, sort of secretly excited on the inside that I was able to pull it off. Um, but I did, and they, they could do it, and, they, and even more, they could produce their own meaning. Right? So, um, let's continue on. Let's, there you go. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what happens when they get out of the language classroom, and they're in sort of the culture literature classroom. The challenges you face here is, are not one, they're, they are linguistic, and you're still dealing with the whole, they can't read and listen at the same time. Intermediate level students can't completely do that. Um, and basically, you know, to go back to this idea of um, visual media, even at the intermediate and advanced level, culture and, and, and the cultural little classroom, Input should still primarily be visual media. And I want to give you all the description of the intermediate low listener according to actual standards. That is, is, they are able to sustain understanding over long stretches of connected discourse on a number of topics pertaining to different times and places. So I can talk about the past and the present over 30 minutes, and they're going to be OK. okay? However, understanding is inconsistent due to failure to grasp main ideas and or details. Thus, while topics do not differ significantly from those of an advanced, an advanced level listener, comprehension is less in quality and poorer in quality. So basically, going back to our issue of cognitive load, I've got my intrinsic load. There's nothing I can do about that. I've got my uh, extraneous load, my presentational mode. I can do a lot to help that. And then germane load, you know, their own processing of it. There's still a little tiny chunk there that they're not getting. And it's usually main ideas and details. And you go, well, how can they not get the main idea of something, right? Because that process of listening to all this information and being able to grasp it in a general level, in a main idea level, they can't do both and read something and listen to me. They cannot do it, right? So in the, in the language culture classroom, and this is an, an example from um, my culture class. Uh, this is Introduction to Spanish Culture. Um, this is usually fourth or fifth, well, no, I'm sorry, fifth or sixth semester, depending upon the student. And um, this is a, a slide about uh, March 11th, 2004, the terrorist bombings in Atocha, uh, well, in and around Atocha train, train Station in Central Madrid. And 
What I've basically done is given them a headline that, well, it's obvious, we, they know that it's on the syllabus that day what we're talking about. And also, I've given them, um, these are basically the occurrences of the day, what happened that morning when all the bombs happened. Um, when I taught this, I, I, basically it broke down right about here, because they were copying all this down, first of all, and not listening to me. Two, they were copying it as if it was sort of all connected to one another, and they were, but I should point out, these were not happening in the same train stations, right? These are all four different bombs that go off in four different parts of the city, and they were completely unaware of that. They, had, they, they were not following that. They were just going, four bombs, right? They must have gone up. Look, they all went off pretty quickly after one another. It must have gone boom, 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 and it's all right there. Not at all. And they didn't get that because they weren't listening to me. They were reading this, and there is nothing about this slide that communicated that general idea to them, right? As opposed to my next slide, which, a lot less words, main idea headline, and the headline reads, well, the, the part of the headline reads, don't doubt it, it's ETA, and that being after the March 11th bombings, everybody thought it was the Bass terrorist group, ETA. The government line was, don't you doubt it, it's ETA. We know it's ETA that did it, and it turns out it was Al-Qaeda, right? And these are the mass protests that result, okay? So the no lo dudes es ETA, right, idea, communicates this main idea of the false idea, don't doubt it, no doubt it, right? It's not ETA. And I was able to communicate that right away, and I was able to talk about these visuals, right? Particularly because it was raining that day, um, and there's a lot of uh, very creative writing about the sort of tears of the Spanish nation, and all the stuff, and I usually give them a reading that relates to that. And I'm able to talk about that, and they're listening to me, usually. You hope. But they're listening to me. And they're following my ideas, and the presentation helps that. Now, this is not, this is still not the greatest slide. I'm constantly developing these. And every semester, students have another hiccup that, that forced me to go back and do it again. Um, but in general, it, it can be pretty successful. Now, when you get to literature and concepts, uh, it's a little different. And this one I put, it's, you can't see it very well, it says El Arte Postmoderno, Postmodern Art. As a modernist and somebody who inv and invariably ends up discussing postmodernism, if you try to explain modernism or postmodernism to an intermediate high language student, they're going to look at you like you are crazy. They cannot completely handle it. So basically I went back to the same recourses I used in the language classroom. Work on found knowledge and go from there. So I did that, and this has actually been stolen from a colleague of mine who, in English who did the same idea. Working with found knowledge, at this point we discuss romanticism. Romanticism is kind of, you know, we all get that this is romantic and we're all pretty comfortable with that, right? Realism as well, all right? It's realist. This is actually a painting, by the way, not a photo, which I think is pretty impressive. And again, they can handle it, okay? Going back to modernism, New descending a staircase, and at this point they've kind of discussed modernism. We've, you know, they might still be struggling with modernism, but they can still identify that this is modernist. Going to postmodernism, and in that transition, working from found knowledge and using painted art, right, they are able to really get the heart of this instead of me just rambling on in Spanish about, you know, simulacra and all that other stuff which I do anyway, but I can explain it a lot more effectively with this. And they can follow me, right? And I've given them, even more importantly, I've given them chunks of information, right? The language student at some point in a course of 50 minutes is going to get lost, invariably. You know, it still happens to all of us. It's, it's just the nature of second language acquisition. In the slide format, I tell them that we're moving on to something else. You can turn the switch back on and start again. Okay. And that tends to help the comprehension. So they don't get bogged down if they don't get romanticism. They might get bogged down. But they don't get completely bogged down. They can still move on. Right? And so breaking it down into chunks of, of comprehensible input helps them pull it together. Um, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about let's, the digital video project that I do. And this is focusing on students' student output. right? And what this process basically does is it's uh, basically what it is, it's a, it's a project in which they use images and their own voice and sound to create an argument. And it's meant to take the place of a formal paper. 
okay? Um, and the reason I started doing it is because, particularly with the intermediate, high, advanced, low student, they are still having trouble. A marker of an advanced student is to be able to extract your ideas from yourself, to draw conclusions and hypotheses about other things. And they're still struggling with that. They still want to just describe something at its most basic level. And so what this project does is basically it forces them to make very sophisticated or more, not very sophisticated, more sophisticated and specific arguments, primarily through the specificity of images, okay? And I have a map of Spain here. In a normal paper, the intermediate student will always fall back on the idea of saying, Spain is a country between France and Portugal, even if we're in a Spanish culture class. And you go, how can that be? You know, or if I give them a, a paper on, uh, you know, Francisco de Goya's the second or third of May, they will start the paper by saying, Goya is one of the most famous painters in the whole world. That's not very specific. And I know that Goya is really famous. That's why he's on my syllabus, right? They are still working with describing things at a very, very basic level. It is still their instinct to want to do that, right? And the specificity of an image means that, obviously, Spain's between Portugal and France. You don't need to say that. And they move on to something else, okay? The next part is it forces them to storyboard their ideas and plan. And this is key for the, for the, for the language student in the sense that even your best students, uh, for example, your English majors who are language students, right? A lot of people tend to think, well, if you can write a really good paper in English and you master a language, that means you can write a good, really good paper in Spanish. And it's not the case at all. And I don't know why exactly, but it's not. And in fact, my English majors tend to struggle with more than anyone because they have a very strong, definitive voice that they want to try to translate into the target language, and it doesn't work. So this forced planning forces them to think about their output at the level of input and to organize their thoughts in advance and understand the underlying structure of the argument itself. And that brings me into the what Bill Patton, the reason I use a mechanic here is because of Bill Van Patten's idea, right? Is that if, if they examine their own input and understand the underlying structure on the argument, the output actually produces much more sophisticated meaning at a much higher level, at a much more specific level, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example, and the example I have for you, I have two examples today, one in Spanish and one in English. Now, and, and part of the reason I chose the Spanish one is I wanted to communicate just how well it worked in a lot of ways. Um, the, the next example I'm about to show you is a student who compared um, Francisco de Goya's work, a 19th century artist, with, um, and, and basically called him a modernist. She said that his work precludes modernism, and she compares his very famous painting, um, The Third of May, with Guernica, with Picasso's famous painting, Guernica. And I'm a little worried about the, sl the, s the sound. She talks too fast, unfortunately. You can tell she's nervous. So you can see, actually, she, basically what happens, even if you couldn't completely understand it, is that the whole sort of description of the painting, right? Oh, it's a modernist work. Oh, it's a, you know, prefiguring on modernism, basically comes out. And she puts them both together, explicitly compares them, 
and explicitly says this is how this works. It's very specific and in the end it was one of the better projects I had. Um, the next example I have is from a colleague who tried this in English and it's from, so it's in English so it's a little easier to understand and also very um, well done and let's see if it comes up. And Within the world of art, and the sound is much better. Portraits have been commissioned since Roman times. Female nudes have been painted since the Greeks. What has changed is the perspectives and techniques used by artists during different art periods. The second half of the 18th century saw a cultural shift away from the age of reason and towards an age of emotion and individualism. This period is known as Romanticism. Through literature, art, and music, Romanticists evoke their raw emotions. They place an emphasis upon sensibility and intuition. Perfect form was disregarded, and instead, new canons were embraced. No longer were paintings to be neutral portraits, but they were to convey the emotions of the subjects depicted with them. A prime example of this new romantic shift towards emotion can be found in Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres' 1814 painting entitled La Grande Odalisque. This work was commissioned by the Emperor Napoleon's sister, Queen Caroline Marat of Naples. Ingress drew inspiration from earlier paintings of seated nudes, most notably Titian's 1583 painting entitled Venus of Urbino. The art period preceding Romanticism is known as Neoclassicism. During this time, artists sought to infuse their works with the ancient Greek and Roman canons of clarity, sharpness of color, and rational spacing. Jacques-Louis David is perhaps the most renowned of the Neoclassicists. David was Napoleon's court painter, and thus a favorite among the new French nobility. In his portrait of Madame de Camier, a literary and political figure in early 19th century France, David's neoclassicist techniques can be directly compared with Ingres' romanticist principles. David paints Madame de Camier as a composed, calm, stoic figure. Her proportions remain true to life. She is surrounded by very little decoration, so the viewer must focus solely on her. The colors, although muted over time, were originally bright and giving great contrast to one another. Madame Recamier evokes none of the emotion found in Ingres' depiction of the Odalisque. Although those women are beautiful, David's rational depiction of Madame Recamier stands in full contrast to Ingres' romanticized term girl. Ingres' Odalisque is not only a romantic piece, but specifically it belongs to the genre known as Orientalism. During the romantic period, Many of the became fascinated with the near Middle East and North Africa and sought to insert themselves into these new exotic cultures through literature, music, and art. Ingres' La Grande Odalisque depicts a Turkish slave girl who works in a harem for the Sultan. She is seated on a richly hued blue bed with expensive fabric strewn about her. An opulent bejeweled mirror lies by her back. Her headpiece contains pearls, gems, and gold. She holds a fan of peacock feathers in her hand. At her feet lies a pipe, which Europeans would have immediately associated with foreign lands and people. The Odalisque is surrounded by the opulence and exoticism always found in Orient Orientalist romantic art. Orientalism, and more specifically Odalisques, as a cultural phenomenon, can even be seen in Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary. In the novel, Flaubert writes that Léonce found Emma's shoulders glowing with amber, like Odalisque at her back. So there seems to be making the point that Ingres' work, among others, did have a romantic effect on everyday people like Leon and Emma, causing them to seek the beauty found in the exotic. Another key component of romanticist art is its idealization of the human form. Ingres came under attack for La Grande Odalisque because he failed to depict the woman as she really was. The woman in the picture does not have the face of a Turkish harem girl, but one of a Western woman. Ingress supplanted the original face for an idealized one that he found to be more beautiful. Ingress came under the most attack, however, for his depiction of her body. Many critics in Paris' Salon harshly critiqued him for making a woman's body too long. Art historians have noted that she seems to have too many vertebrae and that her right arm, which rests along her hips and holds a fan, is much too long for any human body. However, Ingress distorted her intentionally. He chose to move away from the neoclassical ideas of perfect form and painted her to invoke an emotional response, not to document her as she existed in reality. Ingress infused his own emotion and perspective into her, unlike earlier artists who chose to remain neutral when it came to their works. 
Lagrande Elise was not accepted as a masterpiece when it was first created, but it inspired later artists who took Ingres' outlook on Romanticism and made it their own. Henri Matisse, the renowned French artist of the early, of the early 20th century, did his own version of La Grande Elise entitled Nuit Concubine. Matisse, like Ingres, romanticized the Elise, but, his, but he infused his own vision and ideals into the sketch. Ingres' La Grande Elise is a clear break from the neoclassical paintings that preceded it. It is not a perfect imitation of the woman depicted, but instead an emotionally charged piece of, piece of art meant to inspire and intrigue the viewer through its use of exoticism and sentiment, hallmarks of the romantic movement in art. So now to give you an idea of how this would be, how this would work in a language classroom, because this is an English example, she very seamlessly can talk about a description in an argumentative way. The language student, particularly the intermediate student, who has just learned how to describe things that are not themselves, would likely, in a paper, for example, give you a very lengthy description, almost like a plot summary of the painting, then go into an argument about why it's romantic, probably with a lengthy description of romanticism, and then somewhere at the end would give you some semblance of a sophisticated argument about why this particular painting is romantic. The logic basically is just a, a narration of description, and it doesn't actually forefront the argument. This lets them forefront the argument because the image is there. It's already been described for them, and they have to push themselves to go just a little bit further in order to logistically get to that advanced level. So um, here are my sources, and I'm happy to take any questions people might have. <laughs>